So if there is a reason for our existence, the reason must exist before we do. Otherwise, it is not the reason that we came into existence. So you can't make up a reason, you can't make up a purpose after the fact. Either the purpose existed and therefore we came into being, or there is no purpose. So where should we look to find this purpose or this reason for our existence? It's particularly meaningful today where for some reason Everyone is asking the question, even young children are aware, painfully aware, that I didn't ask to be born. If I didn't ask to be born, then tell me why I'm here. And if I don't know why I'm here, then I certainly don't understand why I have to clean up my room. If I don't know why I'm here at all in the first place, I really don't understand why I have to go to school. And why do I have to grow up? And why do I have to accomplish anything? My whole existence is invalid, unnecessary, and yet you're piling all these responsibilities on me? For what? To make my unnecessary existence prettier? Bigger, heavier, who needs it? This is such a valid observation. And it's so uh, intuitive that even young children are recognizing it. So we need to have an answer. If not for ourselves, then for the children. So... Where are we going to look? Where are we going to find this answer? Obviously, if we're going to know the purpose, we have to hear it from the Creator. There's no way I can figure out why there's a desk in this room if the person who put it here won't tell me. Because there are infinite possibilities. And how am I going to know which one is the correct one? Now, I know somebody put it there. It didn't happen by itself. So I know that there is a reason for the table to be here. But how am I supposed to guess? That's why it makes such logical sense that at some point in history, the Creator revealed His purpose to His creations. We know it as Mount Sinai. God came down to Mount Sinai and revealed to us His purpose, His reason, His need for our existence. It's the only source. It's the only source. Nothing else even approaches the reason. So, what do we find when we look in the Torah, and particularly in the Hasidic dimension of Torah, of the revelation? We find that God created the world in order to have a relationship. The way the Torah puts it, it is not good to be alone. It is not good to be alone. It's not impractical. It's not impossible. It's not good. The, the words are precise. It could be very convenient to be alone. If you're self-sufficient, why not? But where's the goodness? And so God creates a world 
creates us, gives us freedom of choice, and now a relationship is possible. That is the vulnerable side of God. And vulnerable is not a weakness. Vulnerable is a strength. The perfect, eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, infinite God is not content to be himself without us. With us is divine contentment. And we, being created in his image, have that same instinct or that same impulse, that same feature. We don't want to be alone even when we're fully capable of it. Even when we think we're perfect, it's not enough. Perfection is not good enough. It's practical. It's utilitarian. I can handle it all myself. But what's the point? Where's the goodness in it? So God created a world. Let's look at the nature of the world for a moment. There are many things that God created in his world that he's not particularly fond of. So when we look at creation, we can't assume that everything in creation is holy and good and, and, and godly because many of the things God did create, he does not enjoy. Those are called sins. The things that God objects to, the things that God is offended by, the things that God rejects. Well, if he is offended by it, why did he create it? In order to enhance the things that are good and godly and holy, the, the contrast, the balance, the challenge, the ability to choose between them, all of that justifies creating things that he does not really like, and maybe even despises, finds abominable. In other words, God creates some things because they're a useful part of the plan. They're technically necessary, strategic. But then there are those things that God creates out of his deepest and truest desire and love for those things. So there are those things that describe him among the created beings. There are things that describe him and there are things that distract you from him because they are not what he enjoys, they're not what he's after, they are not his true intention. They exist only to serve some end, a means to an end. So this is how the universe breaks down. There are those things that are the end that God is looking for, and then there are those things that are only a means to the end. What is the difference between them? When you're raising your children or engaging in an intimate relationship, if I think of you as a means to an end, you will be insulted, you will feel rejected, you will be resentful, and you will feel completely alone in the world, even though I need you as a means to an end. But if you are not the end goal for me, then as much as I use you, as much as I need you, you feel completely alone because it's not about you, it's about a means to an end. So if parents think of their children as a means to an end, I want to raise my children properly so that people will think of me as a great father, as a good parent. I'm just using my kids to make myself feel better. The children will feel it. 
they will know it and they will resent it. But if the children are the end, if the children are my greatest, uh, my greatest consolation for all the aches and pains of life, because they are the goal and not a means to the goal, then they are not alone in the world. And the same is true with a spouse. If it's you that I need, then you feel connected, recognized, validated, and so on. But if it's some service you offer, if it's something I get from you, that's nasty. That's unholy. So those things that God created because that's what he wants in his world, that's called holy stuff. Those things God created and needs, but only as a means to an end, those things are called unholy. That's where all ungodliness begins. Because it is not the essence of his plan, it's just a tool towards achieving the goal. Now what happens? You spoil your child because you're not really interested in the welfare of the child. You just want to get by and you want, you know, you want quiet, not justice. The child knows this. So you give a child an ice cream so that he'll be content and won't bother you. Ten minutes later, the child wants another ice cream. And you say, no, you can't have another ice cream. You've already had one. So here's what happens. You would think that the child would be a little grateful for the first ice cream and think of you as a kind and generous parent. But instead, what happens, the fact that you gave the first ice cream now becomes the poison dart with which your child is going to shoot you. You have to give me a second ice cream because you gave me the first one. So instead of the first ice cream producing a closeness and an appreciation and a gratitude, it turns rotten. It becomes an accusation. Grounds for demand. You must give me another ice cream. In other words, when a child is not the object of your life, of your, of your uh, purpose, but only a means to an end, everything you give that child will produce resentment and not contentment or gratitude. So that's what happens when God creates a being or a, a function in the universe that is, that is not what he really wants. We call that unholiness, but it deteriorates from unholiness into sinfulness. Because <clears throat> those things that don't feel like they are the core and essence of God's purpose, all the life that it receives, all the existence that God gives it, produces only rebellion and resentment. The sin does not appreciate its own creation. You think, look, you may not be holy, but God created you, so can you have a little a little decency? Can you have a little gratitude? No, the opposite. That's the nature of unholy. The nature of the non-essential is that it does not appreciate its own existence. It doesn't appreciate the gifts you give it because everything reminds this being that this is not about you. 
a simple example. If a mailman has to deliver a package, or the UPS guy has to deliver a package to someone who he happens to hate, well, he's got to deliver the package. So he does. You might foolishly think that the person, the enemy, the person that the mailman hates, who also hates the mailman, you would think that there would be a little gratitude. Thank you for delivering the package. There's none. There's only resentment. Why? Because it is so palpable. It is so obvious. The way that the mailman delivers the package, without having to say a word, it speaks volumes. He doesn't look you in the eye. He doesn't hand it to you in your hand. It's like he drops it in front of you, at your feet, and says, here. This is not coming from me. I didn't want to deliver this to you. It's just my job. And I'm not giving this to you because I care about you. Just my job. So this is not really coming from me. If it were up to me, I wouldn't deliver this. And it's certainly not meant for you, as far as I'm concerned. So there is nothing between us. And don't misunderstand my delivering the package as some kind of an acceptance or some kind of approval or some kind of improvement in our relationships. So, that energy, that vibration, does not bring an improvement at all. On the contrary, where is last week's package? Why didn't you bring last week's package? Why do you throw it around like it's... It will only bring resentment, complaints, and animosity. That's what happens to unholiness. The things that are unholy in the world sense that they are not the point. They are not the goal. So whatever is given to them does not have a positive effect on them. There is no gratitude. Which leads us to a very powerful conclusion. By definition, Lack of gratitude is the nature of unholiness. But in unholiness, it's understandable. That's the nature of unholiness. But when people engaging in good activity, positive activity, holy activity, but without gratitude, that's really not appropriate at all. So, if we want to be part of the positive rather than the negative, if we want to be part of the purpose of creation and not a means to that purpose, the first thing we have to gain is a sense of gratitude. Grateful that God needs us, Grateful that we can do something for God. Grateful that we are needed rather than focusing on how much we need. So in unholiness, there's endless need. Give me, give me, give me. And no matter how much you give me, there will be no gratitude. The opposite of that is holiness. Anything you give me, I am grateful for. Because I don't need this. My needs are not what brought me into existence. You need me. And I can do something for you. There's endless gratitude for both being needed and for the opportunity to fulfill that need. That's called holiness. That's called being alive. I want to invite you 
to join us as VIPs, partners in our work, and join us also for uh, a personal chat with other members of the VIP club. We talk about many things. There's an opportunity to ask, to respond, to make a comment, to meet the other supporters. And together, we can really make a difference in Jewish life and in life in general. So join us. It's good to know org. Log in, call, make contact, and join us with the VIPs.